This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio, the show all about you and your rights. Our host is usually Professor Richard Gershon of the of uh, University of Mississippi School of Law. He's not with us today. I am Liz Gill. Have you spent the winter scrolling Zillow looking at houses? Uh, before you start buying or selling, let's find out what we need to know about real estate law from our guest, Terry Little from McKinsey Little Law Firm. Hi, Terry. Hey, Liz. How are you? I am doing great. Welcome to the show. And, you know, I say that one of our former co-workers, that's exactly what they did. They they scrolled the nation looking for houses and found a cute little town and decided to move yep. there. Uh, it, it's amazing what you can do with the Internet now. And folks do like to, to look at uh, housing markets to see what's going on. And l- let's find out what all that they need to know from an uh, attorney. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, you and your background? Sure. Uh, I've been practicing for 25 years now. Uh, I've spent 13 years of that doing litigation probably the last 12 years or so doing transactional real estate practice, which is basically just a a settlement agent um, helping people to buy and sell homes. Excellent. Um, I love, we've had you on the show before, and I love the information that you know from the title work. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that in your background. Sure. So I I started out in law school working for an attorney that was doing uh, residential real estate, and I learned how to abstract properties. You go to the courthouse, pull the records, find out who the sellers are, whether they have good title to the property, find out if there are any liens that need to be released. And and you that's the first step in the real estate uh, sale of property. Uh, And then we we get with the sellers, find out, you know, who they may have a mortgage with, order a payoff for them if they've got one. And then as, a, as the settlement agent, we basically handle the money uh, between both sides and, and have a fiduciary duty to both uh, buyer and seller. And we just try to make sure that everything's on track for a smooth closing for both sides. And is with real estate, you, you know, you've mentioned going to the courthouse to look at things. Is this one of the last not digital uh, yeah. parts of our society now? <laughs> Uh, to a certain extent, there, uh, there's been a lot of uh, records that have been put on the Internet that are abstractors. These are the people that go and search the courthouse records for us that they can pull and look at. And it's usually uh, you're usually looking at photocopies of original documents that have been scanned. And uh, you can so you can do a lot of it online, but there are still a few things that you may need to go to the courthouse to pull. And we sold my mother's property in Arkansas, and it was in a different county from the one I grew up in and where my friends were and my friends who were attorneys. And uh, they said a, a lot of times you you need to work with the people in that county, uh, like a, a, a title person just for that county. Is that the same in Mississippi? Uh, to a certain extent. It is, but we have we use what we call local title abstractors. These are the people that that are familiar with the courthouses. And if there's anything that they can't pull online, they will go to the courthouse and pull the records. And you just want to make sure that you're using somebody that's familiar with that particular courthouse's style of recording documents. There could be certain things like solid waste liens that are kept on a certain computer system uh, that may differ from county to county. Good to know. So let's pretend, and I'm saying pretend because I'm not selling my house, but if we were to put my house on the market, I I would think one of the first things I would need to do is is fill out that seller disclosure form. 
Uh, what are your duties as a seller if you were going to fill out that form? Okay, so there's there's two instances where you could sell your house. You could use a listing agent uh, where you go out and hire uh, a real estate agent to list your property on the multiple listing service, and then you or you could sell it by owner or sell by owner FSBO. And so there's two different duties that arise there. You're only required by law to complete a property condition disclosure statement if you have uh, listed your property with a real estate agent for sale. Um, and then, you know, that provides, that's supposed to provide a lot of information to the buyer so they kind of know what it is they're looking at, what problems the property might have had in the past. Um, and so, but there are exceptions to whether you need to complete one or not. And they're statutory. This is all set out in the Mississippi Code. So, You've got a duty to complete a property condition disclosure statement uh, so long as you have occupied the property or if you have any actual knowledge of the property's condition. So one of the exceptions to the, and we call it a PCDS for short, is you don't have to complete one if you've never occupied the property and you don't have any personal knowledge of the property. And that happens in certain situations where you, you've gotten this property maybe through inheritance, transfer by court order or, or something to that effect, and you really don't have any knowledge. So if that's the case, you would have to mark that you don't have, that you've never occupied the property and that you don't have any actual knowledge, sign it and you're done with the PCDS. Um, and then there are, like I said, those statutory exclusions where you don't have to complete one and that's transfer of the property by court order, transfer by a borrower to their lender if they're in default to their lender, transfer of property that does not have a dwelling on it, transfer to a co-owner or spouse of the property, or transfer transfer to or from any governmental entity. I did not move during the pandemic, but it seemed like some of the real estate was just the wild, wild west uh, going on. Um, I didn't know if, if you're selling it by owner, which... You know, I get if it's a fast market, if you've got a friend or if uh, you've got a cash buyer or you don't want to have to pay a real estate listing fee, a, a seller's fee, you would do that. But gosh, as a buyer to not have a, a property disclosure statement that comment on that a little bit as 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 a home bu owner, buyer person and also as an attorney. Right. Um, if you so if you are approaching uh, an owner that is selling the property himself has not used a listing agent, you can request that they complete a property condition disclosure statement. There is no requirement by law that they do so if, if they're selling it without a listing uh, agreement with a realtor. So it's just kind of a risk you assume uh, if you're buying that type of uh, property. And so you know, I, I would say you definitely get more information whenever a seller is represented by a realtor and they're required to complete this property condition disclosure statement. I was talking with someone about the law um, recently, and they were saying how, you know, it's it's not to uh, restrict you, it's to help you, to protect you. Um, and I would think, you know, like a seller disclosure statement that's, you know, information that a, a, a borrower, a, a buyer would want to know. What if the owner knows something that isn't on the property disclosure? You know, there's not a box for that. Is is there a other, uh, anything I know that isn't covered on this property description that you, that you, you have to know page on the, the form? No, basically, if, if it's not one of the uh, set items of disclosure that you're required to make, you don't have to volunteer any additional information. Now, I will say this property condition disclosure statement is very thorough. So it, it really does cover uh, an awful lot of information on the house. It's, it's based on actual knowledge that the owner has. You don't have to disclose anything that you've been told or heard. It does not provide a warranty of any kind. The property condition disclosure statement clearly says this is not a warranty. So they do encourage that you get a home inspection to make sure that what you're seeing on the 
PCDS is matching up with what the home inspector's report says. Um, now, if, if a seller does make a knowingly false or incomplete statement, that could subject that seller to a claim of fraud to the buyer, but then you're actually left with going back and proving uh, a common law theory of fraud. Um, and so that's that's really, I'd say, the only way the seller gets in trouble with com with completing the PCDS is if they do so fraudulently. We don't we don't want anybody to fill out any legal forms fraudulently. Right. And also, I'll say that if you know, if you enter a contract with somebody and you don't have the PCDS at the time that it's entered, you have the right as the buyer to cancel the contract within three days of receiving the PCDS. If, you, if there's something in the PCDS that you're not comfortable with. Oh, that that is excellent to know, because, yeah, you don't know as a buyer, you don't know what you don't know. That's right. This is in legal terms. Not everybody has a chance to listen to our show live. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show from our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Our host is usually Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. He's out today. I'm Liz Gill. Hey, if you are a homeowner or a wannabe and you need assistance from a contractor or a home inspector, MPB has got you covered with our Wednesday 9 a.m. show, Fix It 101. It is also a podcast. I'll have a link to that information on this show's webpage. We're talking about real estate law with attorney Terry Little from McKinsey Little Law Firm in Oxford. Terry, you're a popular guy. We got three phone calls waiting. Let's first go to Tibby and speak with Ed. Ed, thanks for calling in today. What's your comment or question? Well, uh, I've got a question, and I really don't know how to phrase it because uh, I don't know that much about it. But I've seen on television uh, a warning that scammers know what they're doing can can get access to your deed at the chancery uh, clerk and can get the 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 name transferred over to their name of the property and borrow money on it and then all of a sudden you you have got liens and they have scammed you can you can you address that please sure uh, Ed, I've seen those same commercials. And so everything that's filed at the Chancery Clerk's Office is a public record. It's available to anybody to go look at. That's how our title abstractors are able to go and see who owns what and what liens may be on the property. There are scams that are currently going around where, uh, and this, th there are different scams. There are several scams in the real estate industry because there's a lot of money flowing through the industry. But one of the scams is that we will have a a purported seller uh, claim to uh, have a contract on a property and, and sell it to an unknowing buyer. And so this seller has gone and listed the property with a real estate agent potentially or for sale by owner, uh, has never actually, you know, been in person with a real estate agent if it's listed. And so they'll advertise the property for sale. The potential buyer will contact them they will pretend to be the seller and they will go through the the motions that typically go through and these a lot of times these are properties that don't have any liens on them because uh, one way a seller would potentially know that somebody's trying to scam them out of their property is if they get some sort of notification uh, from a lender or something that they've requested a payoff uh, on a piece of property so a lot of times these properties don't have any liens on them and and they are purportedly sold fraudulently by a seller that doesn't own the property. And, you know, they're usually not discovered until after the fact, after the buyer's paid good money that the seller's taken and, and absconded with, and, and he's really hard to find this fraudulent seller. I will say, you know, these, these advertisements that you see, they basically are selling you uh, the ability to monitor your deed to, to notify or alert you if there's any transfer of property uh, that occurs uh, on that deed. I don't know how good these services are. Um, I would say that I think that 
in most courts that I know of, if, if, a, if a seller can prove that their property was sold fraudulently, they're going to get that title to that property back and the, and the buyer's probably going to be the one that's left uh, being out the money, is my guess. Well, that's interesting. So, I, I'm not seeing those commercials. Ed, do you have? Did that answer your question? Well, yes, it did. But uh, I guess I'm saying is that uh, can they just walk into a courthouse, make these transactions, do the transactions without the original owner knowing about it until after they get notification that they've got a foreclosure because a loan hadn't been paid against it? Yeah, that's correct. And, and so much of it happens. I mean, most of the real estate that we do, the the sellers, the buyers, you know, they they never they never have to step foot in the courthouse. Deeds are delivered to us. We deliver the deeds to the courthouse for recording. That's basically basically all it takes. A uh, chancery clerk is just going to make sure that the deed complies with the statutory recording requirements and also that you paid a filing fee and then that deed's going to get filed. They have no way of going back and checking to make sure that the real seller is the one that executed the deed. It will have a notary stamp that's most likely been affixed to it fraudulently, and, you know, it's a problem. I assume that these these companies are selling like a life lock, uh, just to use a maybe a term most people are familiar with, but instead of locking down your finances, they're trying to lock down your property to uh, purchase a live lock? Well, I think it's I think it's a similar service to that where they're going to notify you in the event that anything has happened with your property. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for your information. Yes, sir. Thanks for calling, Ed. So um, before we get to John and David, would... We, we've talked on the show before about title insurance, and I know buyers get it, but should you have title insurance just on your house or if you are going to sell your house? How? Explain a little bit about how that works and who, who needs it. Sure. So title insurance is usually purchased by the buyer at the time that they are buying the house. And this is done because we've just done a title search on the property to find out who the who the who the seller is and what liens, if any, are on the property. Uh, the title insurance is issued to protect the buyer in the event that there's a failure of title for a covered reason under that policy. And there could be, you know, a multitude of different failures for whatever reason, fraudulent deeds, different things like that. Uh, maybe a minor that. Uh, that purportedly sold property without a court's order, just different things like that. And so that the person that has the title insurance buys it at the time that they buy the property. And then if they go to sell it and then a title issue is discovered at that time, which was not discovered at the time of the purchase, then that person is protected either up to the value uh, of the property, the market value, or the uh, value of the face value of the policy, whichever is less. Okay, so if 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 I bought my house thirty years ago and I used uh, uh, blue, yellow, purple title insurance, and now you're going to come and want to buy my house, and you like to use X Y Z title insurance, and if X Y Z finds something that blue, yellow, purple didn't, then I'm still, the, the seller is still covered under blue, yellow, purple? That's correct. Okay. Good to know. Let's go to Meridian and speak with John. John, we're glad you've called in to In Legal Terms today. What's your question for our guest, attorney Terry Little from McKenzie Little Law Firm in Oxford? I've got a question with titles. Uh, let's see. If there's a conflict with uh, on the deed, I mean, with it, like something maybe the neighboring property has also a, a deed on the same property. How do, how do you determine who's correct on that? Right. So if you if you've got two deeds and the property lines uh, overlap each other. 
we usually go back and see, you know, if it's coming out of a common property, if there was one owner to both properties, and then you look and see who filed their deed first. So it typically, the person that files their deed first on an overlap would have, for lack of a better word, priority over the person that files the second deed. And so we would look at that. And then there's a, there's a number of different ways that you could remedy the situation. Uh, it, of course, everything is goes back to what the intent of the parties was, what, what was intended to be sold, and whether it was properly described or not. Um, a lot of times, if we've got overlaps on property, we just get with the two neighbors and, and work out a, pop, a property boundary agreement with them, where they decide where the property line is, and, and then we record that uh, in the land records, and that fixes the problem going forward. So a little bit of detective work, a little bit of mediation, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times if you can work out a solution with your neighbor, that's the cheapest, best solution. If you get involved in litigation, and you hear it a lot, but uh, you're, you're going to end up paying a pretty good chunk to attorneys. John, did that answer your question? Pretty much, but I, I'm mostly thinking about uh, like I bought my property about a month ago. <laughs> Is there any possible, you know, the title uh, insurance? Is that yeah. covered with that? Yeah. Did you buy an owner's title policy? Uh, it's uh, yes. Yeah, I, I would say with if. If you discover any issue within the past three years, Mississippi has a general three-year statute of limitations. I, I think you'd be entitled to go back against the attorney that did the closing, um, or uh, if you got title, a title policy, you could go back against your uh, title underwriter on that policy. Sometimes these title policies have exclusions. Uh, as to surveys, because we don't know necessarily, you know, where the property lines are. Um, and, and generally to have those exceptions removed from the policy, you've got to actually present a survey to the title company to look at and approve, and then they'll remove the exception from the policy. A good practice, though I don't know that everybody does it, is to survey all the surrounding parcels to the property that you're buying to make sure that there is no overlap the thing that makes it really hard sometimes to determine is that not all of these properties have the same starting point. They usually go to a corner of what we call a section. Uh, and a section is basically a mile by mile square. And then from that section, we read directions and distances basically to the point where the description starts and then the land that's being conveyed is actually described. And so whenever you go and plat these things, you could have some overlap. And it's really, at this point, it's just the, uh, the art of the practice of law to determine whether or not somebody really has an issue or whether it's just something that appears on paper. John, we're so glad that you have brought up this uh, idea to our guest, Terry Little. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, have a good day. All right. This is In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Gershon is our usually our expert host. Uh, I am Liz Gill. He's not here with us. We hope you will subscribe to our podcast or find the MPB Think Radio recordings at mpbonline.org slash radio. We're talking about real estate law with our guest attorney, Terry Little, from McKenzie Little. And, hey, the home show is coming up just as soon as it turns March. It's always fun. The home show uh, from the Builders Association of Jackson will be at the Clyde Muse Center in Pearl Saturday, March 2nd and Sunday, March 3rd from 10 to 5 p.m. both days. Hey, our Fix It 101 crew is going to be broadcasting live from the home show Saturday morning at 9 a.m. again this year. Felder Rushing, our MPB's Gestalt Gardener, is going to give a talk, and I'll have that link on this show's web page. Hey, Terry, have you ever had a booth at a home show? Uh, we have not. I have. Uh, I think I've been down in Jackson one time when that was going on. 
and there were a lot of people there, and we decided to avoid it. <laughs> might, might drum up some new clients. We'll have to find out next time we have the ethics. Are you able to have a, a booth advertising your services? To my knowledge, I think that's okay. All right. Well, it, it might be fun. And then you you and your partner could take turns going looking at cabinets and uh, uh, driveway asphalt options uh, when it's not your turn to, to sit in the booth. All right. We are talking about uh, real estate law, and that's the question David from Horn Lake has. David, thanks for calling in today. What's your comment or question? Uh, thank you for taking my call. I got a question. Uh, I'm a widower. I don't have any children or whatnot, and I'm um, starting to think about uh, getting long in the tooth. And uh, I'm starting to think about uh, tying up some uh, financial affairs. Of what I got several questions. Number one, uh, I've heard of a quick claim deed. Do they ever expire? Can you make a quick claim deed up and just not record it and on your death, then record it? And also, if you, is there any way that... Um, uh, since I don't have any uh, heirs, heirs or whatever, uh, can I uh, give my house to a charitable foundation with like a life reserve where I can live in it until I die? And then when I die, they just take it over? Or how do you dispose of real estate property at your death? I mean, I'd like to maybe, I thought about maybe, uh, maybe uh, deeding it or giving it to a. Um, um, what do you call it, a uh, charitable foundation without having to go to probate. Can you give me some uh, tips on that? Sure. That's a great question. Um, so the first question I would ask you is, um, you know, do you own the property individually or do you own it with anybody else? I got, I've got, i got a title to it, yes. I got own it individually. Okay, so there's nobody else on there. So nobody right now, is. if you were if you were to die, and if you were to die without a will, then that property would pass according to the intestate laws of the state of Mississippi. If if the if the property is in Mississippi, and uh, those people, there's different groupings of people, but the the first tier of people are uh, spouses and children. If you don't have any spouses or children, the next tier are parents and siblings. Um, and then if you don't have any parents or siblings left alive, it, it continues to flow outside to uh, different cousin groups and, and things like that. So you, if you don't have a will, that's the way the property would pass if you were to die, if you were to die without a will. Um, if you were to have a will and you were to devise your property to someone in that will, then upon your death, that property is going to pass to whoever your devisees are in that will. That would require the probate, like you mentioned, um, but it's generally not a, a, a very hard process. You just got to file a probate action to prove the will, give notice to creditors. Uh, the creditors can come in and make a claim against the estate if they're owed anything. Once those claims are satisfied, then whoever your executor or executrix are, those are the people that are the operational people of the will to make sure that your wishes are fulfilled. Um, you know, they can go to the court and ask permission to close the estate and, and convey the property if need be. It's really not necessary. You know, once you once you die and the will's probated, that that property passes to your devisees just subject to any claims of creditors. So that's another way. There's a third way now, and the, this is a statutory way that's just recently been um, enacted by the legislature, and that's a transfer on death deed. It's called a TOD. And so this is a deed that you would complete. Uh, you would, you know, you would name whoever the grantor is, uh, the grantee is rather. You're the grantor, they're the grantee. They would take that property upon your death However, there is a problem with the transfer on death deed, and that is that it is also subject to the claims of creditors, the property is, and so you would still have to go through the probate process. But that's that's a new avenue that we didn't have before. You had mentioned a quit claim deed. So a quit claim deed just conveys whatever interest you own in the property, uh, and it doesn't provide any warranties. So you could you could prepare a quit claim deed, uh, but for it to be effective, it's got to be uh, signed by you 
it's got to be acknowledged by a notary, and then it has to be delivered to the grantee. And so those three things have to be done. Now, the grantee is not required to record the deed in the courthouse. However, you know, most of the time people do record deeds, and that is because it gives notice to subsequent purchasers for value without knowledge. And that just means that if I give you a deed and you don't record it and I've given you the deed first and then I give Liz a deed second and she goes to the courthouse and records it, then Liz has the best claim to the property because she's recorded that deed. Mississippi is a race notice state. So unless you have actual actual knowledge that I've conveyed or that if Liz has actual knowledge that I've conveyed the property to you, she will win in a race to the courthouse because you did not file it. And so beyond the deed mechanisms of transferring property, you know, you can also create a trust in which you create a trust. It could be a testamentary trust, which comes into existence upon your death. Again, this would have to be done in a will and the trust would come into existence upon your death when the pro when the probate of the will happened. Or you can create a living trust where you go ahead and put the property in there and you are the beneficiary of the trust and then at your death you can provide uh, some mechanism for the property to transfer uh, to a residual beneficiary and so that those those are typically the way we see people handling uh, the transfer of property uh, upon their death david thanks so much for for bringing that up that is is interesting. And I will say our family is proof that nobody has no relations. My husband got an inheritance from his grandmother's half brother's grandson. And he collected antique farm equipment or whatever and had enough to share with with the everybody. So, David, there'll be somebody out there who's related to you. Uh, if the the courts have to get involved to decide who it goes to. Thank you, David. Let's go next to Jackson and speak with Michael. Michael, we're glad you've called in to In Legal Terms today. We're talking real estate law with our guest, Attorney Terry Little from McKenzie Little Law Firm in Oxford. What's your comment or question? Well, good morning. I've got a piece of rental property uh, and we recently found some old fire damage in the attic that was not disclosed to us from the previous seller. I'm wondering what recourse I have against that seller for not disclosing that damage. How long ago did you purchase the property? Uh, April of 22, so not quite two years ago. Okay. Were you provided a property condition disclosure statement? I was, but it's a rental property, and so they did the thing where they said they never occupied it and they have no knowledge. Right. Okay. And and so that's that's true. If if you don't have any knowledge, you're not required to complete it if you've never occupied the property and have no actual knowledge. If if the fire happened while they owned it, they would know it and have to disclose it. If the fire happened before they owned it, that previous owner would have had to have disclosed it to them. So then they would have to disclose it to me, right? That's right. And, and the only way that you can say that you've, you, you to, to not fill out the property condition disclosure statement, you've got to make two statements. One, that you have not occupied the property. And two, that you don't have any knowledge of the property's condition. So if if the seller, if the fire happened while the seller owned it, then I don't think he could truthfully mark that he didn't have any knowledge of the property's condition. If the property if the if the property damage happened prior to his ownership, then I think he probably could truthfully say he did not occupy the property and had no knowledge of, of the property's condition. How did how did you discover the property damage? We're uh, replacing the air conditioning, and the guys got up in the attic, and he took some pictures and sent them to me and said, "Hey, here's what we found." Okay. And and so usually what happens and what a buyer usually does to protect themselves for anything that may not be known or disclosed on a property condition disclosure statement is to retain someone to perform a home inspection 
And the home inspector's job is basically to, if they can, get under the house. If it's a conventional foundation, look in the attic, check the status of the roof. Just look at look at it, as many systems and things as they can to try to find anything that might be a red flag for something like a fire that wasn't disclosed to a potential buyer. And so I, I guess my next question would be, did you get a home inspection report? We did. Uh, but on the day of the inspection, the inspector could not get into the attic because the tenant had a giant aquarium under the attic there, and so they couldn't get to it. And so, as they typically do on those inspection forms, they just say, we couldn't get access, we couldn't inspect it. That's right. And and that is that is what they typically will put on there if, if there's something that they can't access. Well, so... This is a tough one because you don't really know when the fire happened, do you? I do not. Okay. This is a tough one. You could you could potentially bring a cause of action against the seller for not disclosing uh, something on a PCDS that might should have been disclosed or they might should have had knowledge of if it happened during their ownership. Through the discovery process, you could try to find out when they bought it, what their property condition disclosure statement had. If, if it was disclosed to them on a property condition disclosure statement, um, it's not actual knowledge, but it is it is knowledge that they probably should disclose to any future uh, buyer. So that's you know this is a tough this is a tough case, but I would probably if it's if it's a lot of damage that needs to be replaced, I probably would contact uh, an attorney that specializes in uh, real property damage, and then just ask them, tell them what your facts are, and and see how they recommend you proceed. Terry, can you call the fire department and see if the fire department has ever been to one two three Sesame Street? Yeah, I think you could. I don't know what records they keep, but I would think somebody's got a record of, of fires that they have to report to somebody. So I would think it'd be recorded somewhere unless it was put out and the fire department wasn't called. There's just, there's a lot that goes into this fact scenario that we just don't know. Well, Michael, it seems like uh, you've still got a little homework to do. I hope you can find someone who can uh, be your representative and help you. Thank you for calling. And the things our, our listeners bring up, it's a, it'll be a lesson for, for someone else. And hopefully uh, your question will help someone else. And good luck getting an advocate for your situation. Thank you for being part of In Legal Terms. So if you've missed any of the program, this has been a pretty good program. We're probably going to have to tag this one to use as a, as a repeat. Uh, if you miss any of it, you can listen to the whole show on the MPB Think Radio YouTube channel. It's also available on the MPB public media app, as all our local shows are. Our host is usually Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. He couldn't be with us. I am Liz Gill. At 11 a.m. Central on Tuesdays, following our over-the-air broadcast, you can hear Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, with Dr. Susan Buttress on MPB Think Radio. So, your rights are being determined right now. If you want to find out what's going on, the MPB News Program at Issue airs Fridays at 6.30 p.m. on MPB Think Radio this is going on through the legislative session. There will be additional content on the Mississippi Public Broadcasting YouTube channel. Republican Austin Barber and Democrat Brandon Jones will have weekly recaps and roundtable discussions about current issues. Will Stribling is our state capital MPB News legislative reporter. We're talking today with our guest, Terry Little, from McKinsey Little Law Firm in Oxford. And Wayne has called in from the Golden Triangle with a question. Wayne, what's your comment or question? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, I would like for the attorney to clear up a, an old myth, and it's prevalent in the African-American community. This has to do with property. Big Mama, excuse me, Papa and Mima left 100 acres of land. 
and the family don't want to divide uh, a Joe's or give him his 10 acres, which you please explain to their the community, it's, even if nine people don't want to get their 10 acres, they cannot prevent Joe from getting his 10 acres and what Joe would be able to do uh, to file a lawsuit against those other nine. Would you please clear that up, uh, sir? Yes, sir. So you're exactly right. If, if you have a situation where you happen to be a co-tenant uh, with somebody else in another property and you would like to either separate your interests from them by, by getting a portion of the property or if you would like to sell the property, there are, there are uh, petitions for partition of property. And there are two different types of partitions. One is a partition in kind where you go to the court and ask them to give you a certain described legal area of property. And, and then the other is a partition by sale where you say this property cannot be partited equally amongst the co-tenants the best thing to do is to sell it and then we'll give everybody their percentage interest in the property uh the seller proceeds and so that's that's two different ways if you find yourself in a co-tenant situation where you need to you know either try to get property owned individually by yourself or if you would just be okay having the property sold uh and taking your interest you know, in money out of the property upon the sale, you could do, you could do both. And we do see this a lot with different families where people are holding on to the property and, and maybe there wasn't a will done uh, at the time of death. And so this property just passes to the heirs at law. Other people will die down the chain and the property just continues to basically splinter into different ownership interests. And, you know, we've had, we've had properties in the past where, somebody had a very small interest in the property and you know there's there's really no way to partite the property in kind where they get a, a small little share because it's not usable and then in that particular case the partition by sale is usually the best remedy but that's definitely a remedy for anybody that finds themselves in a co-tenant situation and they no longer wish to be co-tenants and mpb's in legal terms has had a number of heirs property podcasts um, with the uh, Mississippi Center for Justice. They have they answer a lot of questions about that. They have seminars, so I would encourage anyone who uh, is in that situation and needs assistance or needs further information. We had a show on May twenty fourth, twenty twenty two. Uh, with about heirs property. We also had one on May 7th, 2019. And uh, that Mississippi Center for Justice, they are all right people. And uh, they have, they give uh, speeches and um, talk at conferences and uh, have different ways you can find out more information. Wayne, I'm so glad you brought that up so that our, our listeners can be reminded of, of what their options are. Thank you for calling in. So, uh, Terry, we got about 30 seconds left. Remind us, the lawyer at a closing, is it his lawyer, her lawyer? Who's What's the lawyer's deal? Yeah, so primarily we're the settlement agent, and so we don't represent either the buyer or the seller. We have a fiduciary duty to both. And so, but our job is to make sure that clear title is passing to a buyer and that we're handling the money in a fiduciary matter between the two parties. And so if there's ever any issue that arises between the parties where it's not uh, and, and it's not something they can work out at the closing table, we, we stop the closing, advise both sides that they need to retain their own attorneys. And then once they have uh, the issues figured out, they can come back to us and we can close it. Well, Terry, this has been a fantastic show. You've given the people of Mississippi and the world quite a lot of information. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you, Liz. I always enjoy being on. Our team here at MPB has got uh, our interns, Jordan and Miriam. Our uh, Abram Nanny is the board engineer and our podcast producer. So for Professor Richard Gershon, who couldn't join us today, I am Liz Gill. Join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.
This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.